board. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do, y'all, is we're going to go to page seven on this thing. All right. The last page in this handout. And because we're kind of ahead, what I'm going to do, I'm not ahead. I wish we were. That's never been my problem behind. Um, I'm going to kind of leave it at this and go through some of the major things that you guys need to know for the revolution. We've already hit the big parts, but I need to get you guys on to the Constitutional Convention and the problems with the articles and the Washington and Adams administration. Uh, what I may end up doing is coming back uh, when we get ready for the AP test um, to make sure that you guys have that. I, I don't want to be far behind because that makes it even harder for y'all to pass those district uh, quizzes or tests that we give y'all. So um, I do need to kind of move on and make sure you guys get stuff over Jefferson, basically from Jefferson through to um, James Knox Polk uh, in 1848 and take you guys through that because that'll be the next test from the district and that will be on 11-11-22. Okay, 11-11-22. So we need to kind of start working on that stuff as well. All right, y'all. So if you guys look at page seven here, it's got the key concept right before it. And um, what you guys will have listened to or heard is the part here about Thomas Paine. I'm going to go ahead and go through that. So I guess for those of you that don't have that, uh, the bottom of page six, uh, you guys will see, or the middle part of page six where it says key concepts. Now, there's a lot of information on this particular slide. I apologize for it having so much on there. Let me get rid of my little picture here, give you guys a little bit more room. So if you look at kind of the middle of page six where it says key concept 3.2, the ideals that inspired the revolutionary cause reflected new beliefs about politics, religion, and society that have been developing over the course of the 18th century. You know, we already talked a lot about the Enlightenment and Locke and Hobbes. Uh, so you guys should be able to answer questions about that, the idea of a social contract. And when we do go through the declaration, which, like I said, I'll probably do before the AP test with you guys in detail because it's such a big thing, um, you'll, uh, you'll recognize that. And some of you have already had to. Well, all of you were supposed to read it in that comic I gave you that you highlighted and things. Um, a lot of you read and, and, you know, annotated it nicely or whatever. But the thing is, y'all, um, you know, a lot of people kind of diss the American Revolution and say that there weren't, it wasn't really a social revolution or political revolution. It just changed the nationalities of the people in charge. It was still rich dudes in charge. They just happened to be Americans as opposed, as opposed to British people. But there are changes that we make that, of course, today set us apart very differently from countries like Great Britain. It just couldn't be done overnight. You know, they tried to do that in France, and it really didn't go very well. I mean, the French, y'all, they went so crazy as to get rid of the months of the year, right, to completely change things. Uh, and, of course, that turned out not to work very, very well. Um, now, uh, one of the things that we do in America, and like I said before, we're not perfect. We're, we don't – we haven't reached this yet. You and I know if your last name is Gates – or Musk, or Bezos, or Jobs, your life's probably going to be a little bit better than a lot of other people. You're probably going to get into the colleges a little bit more easily or get a job. But once again, the idea is those people earned it through their talent. You know, uh, Bezos by developing Amazon, Jobs by developing Apple, Gates by developing Microsoft, right? That was talent. They didn't inherit something from mom and dad, okay? Now, of course, their kids are fairly well off. Now, what we wanted to abolish was the notion of titles. You are specifically not allowed to have titles, y'all, in America, unless, of course, you're a rapper, right? Like when I was younger, there was Sir Mix-a-Lot. One of my favorites was Sir Loin. Okay. But anyway, um, so, but you know, you can't have titles like lady or sir or lord or whatever. You know, we, we abolish those kind of titles. But even better, and that's why it's in bigger letters, is we got rid of what's called primogeniture. Primogeniture. Now, 
you use your Latin or Spanish or whatever you guys may know some of. Primo, first. Genitor, genus, born. Firstborn, right? The firstborn. So, and they mean firstborn son. Now, it's just like, you know, until relatively recently, who became king when the, when the queen died? Was it the firstborn son, the firstborn period, or the firstborn girl? What was it? It was until recently firstborn son. If she had like six daughters and then finally has a son, guess who gets it? The son. Now, they only changed that, I think, in y'all's lifetime or for sure just a little bit before y'all were born. That's like one of the biggest examples of primogenitor. The firstborn son gets everything. So what's supposed to happen with the daughter? Well, the daughter gets married off, right? The daughter gets a dowry. Um, you give her a dowry. What's the dowry? It's what she takes into the wedding, right? Because you got to remember, and I know this seems kind of weird for you and me today, but people didn't used to marry people just because they were in love. If they learned to love each other, that was great. But marriages, y'all, often were just sort of an accommodation, like, well, she's a good family. We're a good family. Yeah, it'll be good for our families to get together. And hey, you may end up liking her, right? That's kind of the way things were done, and especially among wealthy people. And so you often married a woman based on what her dowry was, what she was bringing in. Was she bringing in a 1,000 acres? Was she bringing in money and jewels and gems? You know, she sure got better looking the more land she had, right? Um, and so fathers, y'all, hated having daughters because they had to give a dowry out. Now, if you think that's old and quaint, and we don't have anything like that anymore, ladies, when you get married, and all y'all get married and have lots of smart AP kids, right? When y'all get married, um, who pays for the weddings? Does the guy pay for the wedding? Does the guy's family pay for the wedding? The girl's family, especially the girl's dad, pays for the wedding. That's sort of a legacy of the old dowry. You know, you get something for marrying this girl. She's rich. You're going to have a great wedding. She's poor. Well, you know, there is that little Elvis Chapel in Vegas you can go to. Um, and so the thing is, y'all, the firstborn son got everything that didn't go to the daughters as dowries. Okay. What if I'm the second or third born son? Well, guess what? You're, you know what, out of luck. Now, it might seem cruel to do that, but the reason they did that was so that the family estate could stay together. You know, people had large families then before birth control, right? And, you know, people were living longer and more of them were living. And so let's say you had three or four heirs and spares and you divided your land among four of them. Well, that estate got made a lot smaller. And then if each of those kids has three or four kids, what happens to the estate? Even smaller and smaller. And before long, you know, your dad is promising you, son, when I die, this square will be yours. Okay? You know, about this big. And so that's why they did it that way, because they wanted to maintain those big estates. But, of course, with a big estate comes a lot of power. Remember? We believe in this concept of kind of giving people, I know it's not perfect, but giving people more of an equal chance than if, you know, you have these super uber rich that have everything and that. Now, of course, we've, you know, got a long ways to go still on that, but understand that. So we outlawed it in a lot of states, y'all. We got rid of that. So that's definitely something you could say the revolution did to promote equality. And that's what that means. The eldest son inherits most, if not all, of the property, right? So you get that. All right. Now, the next thing I want to talk about here is a little bit about the role that religion played. Now, these people, and it's no slam on us, or maybe it is, I don't know. These people were much more religious than most of us are, right? Especially those up in New England. Remember, they come over here to escape, to escape religious persecution. All right, so they come over here, and um, what ends up happening is uh, they come to believe that they have a covenant with God, an agreement with God, much like the one God had made with the people of Israel. Now, the people of Israel eventually failed. They messed up. 
God punished them. They went going all different directions according to the Old Testament of the Christian or the Old Testament of the Bible. The Christians is, of course, the New Testament as well as the Old. But anyway, y'all, so these people believed that they had this, this job to do. They had, and God would support them. God had blessed them with more liberty than anybody ever had in the world. And this concept has become kind of known as exceptionalism, that America has a special mission to perform for the world. We're to be the example. We're to help others be more like us. Now, you and I might not like that idea. It doesn't matter if we like it or agree to it. They believed it, and they acted on it, right? And so when Thomas Paine writes the book that we're going to talk about here, or the pamphlet, it's a pretty small pamphlet, just 77 pages, large print, 44, small print. Um, Americans go with that. I mean, he says America is to be an asylum of all mankind, that liberty hath been hunted around the world, right, like a criminal. And this is the only place still left, all right? So in 1776, y'all, probably one of the two most important books ever published in America comes out. The other, I think personally, is Uncle Tom's Cabin before the Civil War, y'all, because nothing brings home the horrors of slavery like Uncle Tom's Cabin did for many readers, right? Made many people into anti-slavery or ab abolitionists. But in the 17th or the 18th century, all the 1700s, no book is as important as this little pamphlet, okay? Now, it was published in 1776 anonymously. Thomas Paine came over here. He had failed at everything in life, y'all, except failing. In failing, he was a great success, okay? Uh, he had even made corsets. Y'all know what corsets are, right? The things women used to make that went around their waist that kind of made their waist narrow and pushed up their, their breast, right? Because men like the hourglass shape. And so these things you know, would literally squish organs out of place and shorten the lifespan of women. But it was worth it because they look good for us men. No, it wasn't worth it, obviously. I was just being a pain to see if you guys, I could get a reaction out of it. But anyway, so the thing is, he had tried that and failed. But what he was good at, y'all, was arguing and writing. And Ben Franklin meets him, and Ben Franklin sends him over to America and with a letter of introduction. Now, having a letter of introduction from Ben Franklin goes a long way. Just about the time he gets over here, y'all, we get Lexington and Concord, and we're at war. But most Americans still want to make up. In fact, we even send something called the Olive Branch Petition to the British. Uh, when you offer somebody an olive branch, what does that mean, y'all? Peace. You're wanting peace, right? And so we're like, hey, king, man, let's make up, dude, you know? Um, and uh, the king rejects it. But you had Americans still trying to do that, still trying to offer. Even after the, blo the bloodshed, y'all, Thomas Paine couldn't believe that. He thought it was just absolutely insane that a country as big as America, you know, a whole continent-sized area, would be under the control of, of a little island. Now, he called it common sense because he challenged King George III. He said it was common sense that Americans break away from this corrupt monarch. And he talks a whole lot, y'all, just about the stupidity of hereditary monarchy. Now, the first guy that's your king, he might be pretty awesome. You know, he kicked other people's butts in war, and he's brilliant, and he leads your country, and he does a good job. Is there any guarantee that his son is going to be equally sharp and good? No. What if he comes out like a, you know, a, a moron, y'all, a moron? Well, can you get rid of him because he's a moron? No. You're stuck with the morons, okay? And the moron's probably going to have moronic kids. And there you go. You're stuck with this. So he said, having a hereditary monarchy is just stupid. He called the king the royal brute. And then, of course, you got to realize this is the age of enlightenment, right? We now knew that the Earth orbited the sun and not vice versa. Remember how we used to think everybody orbited us? Uh, we later learned, no, it's actually Kim Kardashian that everybody orbits, right? But the thing is, um, you know, we orbit the sun. And uh, he said, nowhere, 
nowhere in the solar system, and they had a decent knowledge of the solar system there, y'all through the invention of the telescope, nowhere does a larger object orbit and be controlled by a smaller object. Yet exactly that is what the British are doing. This little island of Britain, Great Britain, is controlling this whole continent. It's madness, he said. Now, when he wrote this, I guesstimate probably 5 to 10% of Americans really wanted true independence completely from Great Britain. Everybody that read this, y'all, and everybody read this. Now, he didn't put his name on it because it was treason to write this. He had a hard enough time, y'all, finding anybody to publish this, this little pamphlet. But finally, a Philadelphia guy did. And uh, it just changed minds. People would get it, read it all night, pass it to somebody else who would do the same and pass it to somebody else. It was one of the first books that I know of to be openly bootlegged, right? To be openly copied, pirated, whatever you guys want to call it. And so it sold ridiculously large numbers of copies and even more people read it. And he single-handedly, y'all, makes Americans decide, you know what? It is common sense that we get independence from Great Britain. I'm going to skip this video for, uh, for that, y'all. And uh, now, the Declaration of Independence, all right? The Declaration of Independence, y'all, is inspired by John Locke. You guys know that. I've talked about that till you're sick of it. You know, the Second Treatise on Government. Um, and also Thomas Paine, obviously, um, some of his ideas in, the, uh, in Common Sense end up finding their way into the Declaration of Independence. He's an Enlightenment figure. He, by the way, y'all, will eventually make his way uh, to France, where he will be a figure in the French Revolution. But he was too radical even for the French, y'all, after he writes the Declaration of Rights and Man, and he gets his butt kicked out of France. He ends up dying penniless, y'all, and they didn't even have a place to bury him. And for the longest time, there was just a box of bones that somebody kept before eventually they could afford a place to bury the guy. I always wanted to have a band called Thomas Paine's Box of Bones. Figure that'd be a great band, right? It'd be like pirate rock or something. But anyway, um, so we have we have that. There's only, as far as I know, maybe one statue to this guy. And yet more than anybody, with the possible exception of John Adams, but you know, John Adams was for independence and talked about it before anybody else, but nobody converted as many people as Thomas Paine did. And that's why. I, of course, have a bobblehead of Thomas Paine. Guess what he's holding in his hands? That's right, copy of Common Sense. You know, I usually have a copy of Common Sense, but I've lost my Common Sense. Uh, yeah, okay, bad joke. All right, so let's go finally to where I said we would start, page 7. So the push for equality, y'all, after the, the Revolutionary War, you know, there are people that say, man, those guys, when they wrote all men are created equal, they were lying. Well, maybe to you and me, that doesn't seem to make sense when obviously women weren't equal and African-Americans, especially those being held as slaves, were not treated equally. Native Americans weren't being treated equally. But we do begin to set that as our target, right? That becomes our, our destination. And essentially, y'all, that's what America is. We're on the road, always trying to get closer to that elusive goal, right, of equality for all. Now, there's a big push for this equality after the revolution. A lot of people, y'all, begin to start talking about the abolition of slavery. I think I put that line there twice or whatever. But anyway, a lot of people start pushing for the end of slavery. You even have some people sue for their right to, uh, to be freed and win in a court of law up north. And pretty much, y'all, from the time of the end of the revolution, you start seeing the northern states getting rid of slavery. Now, something you guys should write down in the margin there. I know I'll say it in several other places. All right. Now, so... In the North, y'all, you have people calling for the abolition of slavery. You even have some brave people in the South calling for the end of slavery. Not many, but there are some. But one thing that does happen, and please make a note of this, that does happen 
is when the Northwest Ordinance is passed. Northwest Ordinance is passed in 1787. Thomas Jefferson, okay, made sure that there is no slavery in future states, in future northern states. So essentially, y'all, what, what Jefferson does is he bottles up slavery in the South. Now, he had hoped to not allow slavery in any new states that would come into the Union. But he's only able to get enough votes for it to be banned in the North. And this is another really big step, y'all, for the ultimate ending of slavery. So, you know, and you, people may not like me saying this, but in a way, cut our founding fathers a little bit of slack. You know, they did the best they could at the time. A lot of people are like, man, they should have ended slavery then. They should have made everybody equal. They should have done this, given women the right vote. You know, you you got to sometimes make progress, y'all, by little steps. You just can't overnight change everything and expect everybody to be thrilled with it. You have to work at it. And so they started the process of ending slavery. Sadly, it'll take a civil war to finally end it, which is indeed that is blood on their hands that they couldn't have done more in that case. All right. So we do see the people calling for it. We see northern states. And some of them, y'all, did it where slaves were freed pretty quickly. Some of them did it where it might take 20 years to gradually free slaves. Some of them even said all people born before a certain date will remain slaves. And those people born after the date will be freed. Man, I know how I'd win that competition. Like, oh, man, Bob, you were born in 1159 just before the time that would have made you free. Yeah, yeah. And, in fact, there was a guy, y'all, who was born the last day, and he remained a slave for the rest of his life, and he lived a long time, and he turned out to be, like, the last slave to die in Massachusetts. It was um, it was really sad, but that's how they did it. Okay, Pennsylvania is among the first. The war isn't even over yet, and Pennsylvania has a gradual abolition. Now, when we start talking about the abolitionist movement, y'all, in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, one of the big arguments will be the immediate, immediatist, and the gradualist. Now, there were people, y'all, who like slavery is a deal with the devil. We end it right now. All slaves free from the moment we pass the law. Other people like, dude, that would be crazy. If you do that, we don't have jobs for these people. We don't have, you know, places necessarily for them to all live. You just can't do that. It would destroy our economy, some people said. So you had others, y'all, that were called gradualists. And gradualists believed we would gradually end slavery over 10 years, 20 years, or whatever. Okay? Now, one of the things that Pennsylvania's law did, y'all, it prohibited importation of slaves in Pennsylvania. Now, in the Constitution, they also made some marks against slavery. They allowed the slave trade, that is, the bringing of slaves into the country, for another 20 years, until like 1808, 1807 or something. Now, some of them wanted to get rid of it completely. You'll, you'll just have to keep the slaves you have here and their children. No longer kidnap and bring people to this country. Others were like, no, that, that would be a disaster. So a compromise was made with the South. We'll let you import slaves for another 20 years, but after that, it stops. And indeed, it did. Once again, another blow against slavery that our founding fathers did. They maybe couldn't get rid of it all, but they definitely put it on the path of extinction. So that was one thing that they did. All children who were born in Pennsylvania henceforth would be free, even if their parents were slaves. That was another part of that particular law. Okay? Now, other northern states continued this policy, and Pennsylvania's gradual abolition, y'all, basically was the model that others followed. So if you guys are asked, did the revolution really change anything for people, you can give a kind of answer, right? But give evidence on how slavery, for example, was put, as I said, on the road to extinction. You also see a lot more people wanting more participation. In one of those videos you guys saw, you saw that New Jersey, for example, let some women and some free black men vote, okay? 
Um, that was something that was tried out, didn't really last very long, but they did do that. Now, one of the most famous lines of all, and one that you guys just have to know, is the story of Abigail Adams and her words to her husband, remember the ladies. Now, Abigail, y'all, in any later century, Abigail would have been a senator, a congresswoman, maybe even a president. She was a brilliant, brilliant woman and equal to John Adams. And in fact, the lucky guy, the discussions that they probably had and, and did have in letters and things like that. So when he's gone from, you know, Braintree, Massachusetts, now called Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, after his son and the family, she is at home, like the women did back then, tending to everything, keeping everything working on the farm and all of that. But she's writing her beloved husband, who's busy working on this Declaration of Independence. And so she says, in your new form of government, John, I would wish you would remember the ladies. In other words, make sure that women get some rights, too. Because remember, women had very few rights. They didn't have right to their properties and, and stuff like that. And so she wants him to give women some rights. And, uh, and I love John Adams. He's one of my very, very favorite presidents. He's absolutely brilliant. He's really underrated. But this is one time where I really don't like him. Because when he writes her back, he writes her back like it was a joke. He's like, oh, aren't you a saucy one? Yeah, man, with this revolution going on, we've had people saying slaves are not listening to their masters. Kids aren't listening to their teachers anymore. Servants aren't listening to their masters. You know, but hey, I never expected we'd have a rebellion from 50% of us, you know. And, uh, and so he says, we men are too smart to give up the reins of power. And so that kind of ended it. But many people, y'all, see her words, remember the ladies talking to her husband, as the opening salvo, the opening shot in the rights and the fight for women to have equal rights. So if you ever have to write about that, and there's always a good chance, don't forget to remember the ladies and remember Abigail Adams' uh, admonition to her husband there. We also see some women advocating for education. Now, women could go to about sixth or seventh grade, y'all, maybe even eighth grade equivalent, but college was not available to women. Now, you got to remember, there was essentially no high school. You finished intermediate and then you went to college, right? And so basically women got an intermediate, you know, um, junior high kind of level of education, if that. She wanted women to be able to go to school past that, to go to colleges and things like that. Now, another concept, and man, y'all, does AP like to ask about this. For many years, I forget how many in a row, they had a question about Republican motherhood right? It's a big deal. Now, women were expected to teach Republican values. Now, that's a little R. We don't mean Republican as in the political party. We mean to teach kids, boys and girls, to be good Americans, to be good citizens, right? Um, it says a lot about men's confidence. Um, you know, uh, I wrote they were moral leaders, sorry I misspelled that, and teachers of civic virtue. Civic virtue is being a good citizen, you know, learning to follow the rules, but to also to do your responsibility. You know, so many of us, y'all, today we focus on our rights, but a lot of us forget that we also have responsibilities uh, along with those rights. That was the job of women to teach men, our little boys and their little girls, on how to be good citizens, how to participate you know, how to do their part, that kind of thing, okay? And what does this lead to? Well, it does lead to women, you know, being able to get more educational opportunities. Because if you're asking women, y'all, to do this, to be sort of these moral leaders, they have to have more education, okay? So please, please remember that if it comes up, it develops during and after the revolution, and it stays around for a long time. Now, the last thing AP really wants you guys to know about the revolution as well as the Declaration of Independence, both of which we'll talk more about at a later time, 
is its impact of the DOI, the Declaration of Independence on the world. Now, when I was grading y'all's notes uh, today, one of the questions was, why is it called the shot heard round the world? And a lot of y'all just wrote, caused a revolution. Like, well, yeah, caused a revolution here, but why is that important around the world? It's because our revolution, y'all, is going to inspire countless other revolutions around the world. So that's why it's heard around the world. Here you have a colony rising up against its mother country. That was unheard of, and we were the first to do that. The French Revolution, which, of course, doesn't turn out too well, it was definitely a child of our revolution. They just went a lot further. They didn't know when to stop. We didn't get to the chopping off heads part and having a dictator like Napoleon take over part in our revolution. We had the sense to stop, but the French didn't. Also, y'all, shown here on the left is Toussaint L'Ouverture. He helps Haiti get its independence, becomes the first black republic in the world. And finally, in Latin America, you have this man, Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar, y'all, is going to help lead a lot of countries in Latin America get their independence. He doesn't lead Mexico's uh, revolution, uh, but he does lead others there. And all of those, y'all, were inspired by that. And what is Simon de Bolivar known as? The, Washington, the George Washington of Latin America. He won the revolution. He won several. All right, that's it. Thank y'all.